this was the military's interest. They want to be able to provide decision rendering under duress as, as an enhancement to a human being's ability to recognize and perceive threats and respond. Yeah, well, the trouble with the military is, though, they'd want to influence that decision. Oh, of course. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> believe me, I'm just explaining the, the logic of how we're getting to where we're going. I understand. The commercial world then extracts from this some core components, some functionalities that it's become aware of. And I went, I've gone, over the past 18 months, I've been to over 30 different technical and academic as well as commercial symposia, conferences, trade shows. I've talked at a few of them, submitted papers here and there. But, I mean, I've gone to events like, here we are, the first international conference on autonomous agents, the first international conference on multi-agent systems, the first conference on virtual humans. I am not Virtual kidding. humans. Virtual, and I, in fact, the second conference comes up uh, in about a month and a half, and I'll be there, of course. And here's the point I'm trying to get across, that these are no longer theoretical ideas or some kind of tangential with the uh, thrills of, of science fiction writers' imagination. No, there's teams of engineers figuring out how to optimize these processes and put them online as a resource, as a strategic resource, as a competitive resource, and potentially a predatory resource. Predatory. My agents are smarter than yours. Yeah. Therefore, I will crush you in the open field of battle on the virtual terraform. That's wow. Awesome. And people who are strategizing how to position themselves as strategic entities in this virtual terraform, they're arming themselves now with the smartest intelligence engines they can you know, devise for their own purposes. The ability to fetch up that kind of resource on demand has a valued added, uh, it has a valuation. It is against these kinds of commodities that trading will occur. In other words, having some physical stuff represent the value of the company will have less value than having access to this. And as people begin to accept this in their course of their daily life, whether it's their entertainment, their educational proceeds, etc., the whole idea of surrendering through your belief barrier into the external realm or the decision-making process, knowledge conditioning, and the acceptance of other alternative forms of reasoning, you might say, becomes the norm rather than the exception. I understand the fascination, but doesn't this scare the hell out of you? Well, it's one of those things where the risk-gain ratio magnifies at every new rung on this ladder. And that's why I wanted to go down this ladder rung by rung. But once... Uh, you, all right, I'm going to ask again. How far away do you think we might be from the first sentient entities uh, created or um, uh, self uh, a creation uh, on the internet, on on this on, on, on the net, it's probably happening now, but very quietly. In terms of, if you go to any of these conferences, there's like a dividing line. You have the autonomous robot world where they try to cram a bunch of intelligence into an actual physical thing that walks around and senses things and does, you know, the R2D2 model. Physical world, yes. The physical world, but that's still we still have some very specific engineering limitations, which, by the way, nanotechnology solves. I mean, that's, that's the segue I'm going to go to next. But as far as where we're at now and how to engineer this kind of stuff, I wrote a paper about a year and a half ago where I recited their requirements, like a, like a laundry list. And I said, if I had such and such, we could build a sentient engine with these behavioral qualities. Over the course of that 18 months, sure enough, different individuals or groups uh, would appear magically out of the fabric of the uh, of the outer realm and say, Charles, we read this paper, and guess what we have? And so over these course of these months, we've been able to assemble, in my belief, the pieces of the puzzle. And we're, we're not alone in this. There's a whole collection of folks out there. All right. Here's a question for you. Sure. Uh, I have a fear that the first sentient entity on the net uh, may well be a virus. Well, not exactly a virus, but something capable of spawning viruses as its own defensive mechanism. There you are. And now listen to this. this In other words, it's reactive. It would. Uh, yeah, it yes. And actually, I, I'm sorry to have my notes here in front of me. It's rather clumsy because I have such a plethora of different kinds of material I have to have. Uh, in the world of security, in fact, I'm addressing a, a visiting group of Japanese dignitaries on this exact topic. Um, right now, there are a handful of folks here in this country, finally, after many, many years of sort of not getting around to it. They finally are being recognized this as a strategic implementation of policy. Oh, yes. It's not going to be a bomb that blows up or even a biohazard or some other 
physical amount that's going to cause real harm to this country. But heaven help us, should the electronic infrastructure, our banking systems, our transactional process, all of our data banks, if that were to be in some way, even in a, in a fairly minor way, put on hold, even for a short amount of time, you would have absolute anarchy in the streets. Kaboom. Kaboom. I mean, eight, ten days max, it would be free for all, it would be wild panic. All of your electronic currency would have no value. We're still using coins and pieces of paper, which is about to go away, by the way. E-cash is right around the corner. Mm -hmm. There's a whole other agenda about that, which probably I shouldn't get into because it would be too complex for the moment. But what I'm trying to get at is you have this convergence, as I say, of all these different forces, socioeconomic, uh, political even, as well as technology in a big way, all focusing on a common target. And the timeline of a target, here's where your clicking comes in, like I said, it's a matter of a very small handful of years. And it will be fed to the outside world, to the, the general public in layers that will be ever more temporarily compressed together. And what will happen is people will be sort of indoctrinated into accepting these things as the norm of their world. So right now, which is why I'm teaching a course on teaching at SS State, this is the moment in time to try to at least gain some sense of awareness of how these things are happening and what form will they be presented to you most likely as an entertainment product, per se, at first, mm -hmm. and knowing how to adapt and therefore empower yourself to use. These tools can be useful. As an educational system, I see spectacular potential oh, yes. for a oh, great gain. Of course. Uh, but if, we're, if this process were inverted in a negative way, well, all bets are off. Hence the evolutionary test. All right, well, and, it's going to depend very much on who is controlling it. And thank you very much. The issue of control was, was right about that. That was around the corner. And we're looking at a decentralized communication grid. It's not like you have big, giant nodes where everything branches out from the common node. Almost the exact opposite. It's, okay. like, it's like the cilia of a mold growing over the face of an orange. That mm -hmm. in itself is its own protectionary mechanism. Mm -hmm. that, is a, that is an evolving structure which is self-preserving in its own contextual interplay with the human symbiotic relationship with this thing we call the Internet. And talking about belief barriers one more time, imagine now we get to a realm where we accept the idea that we're going to surrender our belief to this external engine of intelligence that sees this, the conditionalized knowledge terms as part of our daily life. We now take that with us to every aspect of even our culture, let's say, now, is it at that threshold that Michael Crichton's vision of the flattening it out, if you will, of yes. diversity, that could be where that you know, it occurs? Oh, I would think that uh, Michael Crichton's uh, 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 model uh, could occur significantly before the dangers that you're talking about when you really get this, uh, uh, this, this surrendering of one's belief system. Um, then, at that point, you have more than Michael Crichton was talking about. You have you have the beginning of the board. Possibly, but it, th this is an evolutionary test. The fact that these things will coagulate together into a, common, into a common fabric of functionality is unavoidable. How the fabric is woven, I think this has been played out, like I said, in many different worlds out there in the known universe. All right, a bunch uh, of them failed before they even got this close, by the way. Some have gone beyond this point. All right. and, and I want to submit to you the following thing. Well, no... It, well, let the following thing be submitted after the news. Oh, I'm okay. right. sorry. I apologize. We're at a break. Charles Osman is my guest, and we will be right back. Are we going to ever go back to where we started from? <laughs> Keep listening. Not a chance, folks. So you might as well sit back and see where it is we're headed. And I'll tell you, it's such a strange place. Keep listening. Here again, Art Bell. Close your eyes and try and imagine a world where the internet has progressed it doubles now every three or four months whatever it is in size up to the point where it is delivering virtual reality to you even in uh, a non-direct connection to your brain uh, something like a virtual world it's right around the corner to the degree that they now know that a human being surrenders their belief system to a virtual world. Are you grasping that? Well, uh, we'll try and make it a little clearer for you, uh, if possible, in a moment. My guest is Charles Osman. He is an expert in nanotechnology, uh, but we haven't even launched into that right now. We're still into the middle of this 
growing neural nets. All right, now, who is Charles Osman? For those of you joining us at this hour, he is a member of the Science Advisory Board of NanoThink, a privately funded nanotechnology think tank and development research facilitation and consulting group. Also a senior fellow of the Foresight Institute, a senior fellow of the Institute for Global Futures, currently the science editor and author for Mondo 2000 magazine, technical editor, author for Midnight Engineering, and contributing editor and author of Robotics Digest. He's also currently authoring a piece for IEEE Spectrum on the topic of, get this, biomolecular nanocomputing systems and devices. And the first hour of conversation concerned virtual reality, the net, and the fact that we are virtually, right now, on the very edge of sentient beings being born on the Internet or created sentient beings sentient entities, uh, independent thinking aware entities that are in this giant neural network. It's incredible to even consider. Listen, um, we have got the first crop circle of the year on our website. You're going to want to see it. It's incredible. It's in uh, a brand new crop of green and it is beautiful. It comes to us from England, and we were waiting for the air photo. We've got it. It's on my website, www.artbell.com. www.artbell.com. All right, once again, here he is, Charles Osman. Charles. Hello. Hi. Um, all right, so you really think that we're not all that far from the virtual world that we can deliver through the net to people that will cause them to begin to surrender their belief system. When that occurs, then we are at the point where there will be sentient awareness beings traveling that net. Is that... That's, that you're, you're pretty close. In other words, all the components are sort of there waiting to be interconnected. I, I have studied this to a depth now where I feel that it's no longer this impossible barrier. It's certainly that there are some serious engineering difficulties that will have to be addressed, but it's not like this impossible concept. There are enough viable, working, functional prototypes in their various stages of development that says, yes, combined in X way, this could be the result. I'll tell you where the failure point is right now. It's not even so much can we have a faster through, but can the novel size be faster at the home? Yes, it can. I mean, if you have a cable provider interconnect to your smart digital TV box, if you will, that looks like an Ethernet connection. It's much, much faster than typical modem is now. Right. You would have already very fast, unbelievably fast, really, uh, uh, very inexpensive sort of performance characteristics. CPU chips, you have what are called glint chips, which are these integer math rendering chips that can produce very compelling 3D graphics in the slide. May, may I ask us a question? Sure. Uh, we now have uh, top of the line pretty much for uh, IBM right now is a 200 megahertz chip. That's about right. Um, what is what is technically feasible uh, using current um, engineering paradigms? Uh, what what speed can be reasonably expected before we go biological? Okay, if, if, and, and actually you define that quite well because it's not going to be making more or faster the same. It's going to a different, entirely different process altogether. But in our current modality, you start to approach a gigahertz, let's say, then things get very funny indeed because everything looks like an antenna. You have RF signatures which simply pollute everything up to get into storage. I mean. People can do gallium arsenide and other specialized materials at 2 and plus gigahertz now, but those require very unusual packaging and, and routing techniques and the whole engineering subscience of that, which is not ever going to really get into the commercial. In other words, five times the speed of the 200 megahertz.